In a world where we're constantly flooded with information, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by conflicting advice and trends. That's why on today's episode of The Real Wealth Show, I'm answering your questions so you can make informed, confident decisions when it comes to real estate investing. We'll be covering a range of topics today, how to get started with little capital, how to tap into your home's equity to acquire your first rental property, and when do you have enough in your portfolio. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. I just want to take a moment to express my gratitude to all of you in the real wealth community. Whether you're just starting your investing journey or you're a seasoned pro, I'm truly thankful for your continued support. We now have over 77,000 members at Real Wealth, and it's an honor to be able to provide you with support and resources to help you build your real estate portfolio. From this podcast to our website, realwealth.com, we're here to support you every step of the way. So thank you for being such an integral part of this community. Now let's dive into today's episode where I'll be answering some of the most frequently asked listener questions. The first one how do I start investing in real estate if I only have a little bit of money? All right, the first thing I would do if I only had a little bit of money is talk to a lender because usually you have to borrow money to acquire an asset that's over $100,000. Most people don't have that money just sitting in their bank account. So talk to a mortgage broker or a, a loan officer to find out what you qualify for. And if you don't qualify, find out what you need to do to get into a position where you can borrow money. Uh, it could be that you need to fix your credit, or it could be that you need more money in savings, or that you need to have a two-year job history. Whatever it is, the more you know your power to leverage to borrow that money, the sooner you'll be able to go do that. Once you find out, then for me, the most obvious thing is to do a 3% down loan. You can only do that on a primary residence. So if possible, find a property that could make a good rental for the future, but that you'd be willing to live in for a short period of time. And then you can get a loan as a primary residence because your intention is to live there. But nowhere does it say you have to live there forever. So you have to live there for a period of time. And then there needs to be a reason why you no longer live there. Maybe your job moved or you needed to get back to family or whatever. Then you can rent that property out. But in this kind of a situation, you could put 3% down. You probably will pay mortgage insurance, but it still is a way to get you in a property with very little money. And if you're able to get a little bit of a larger place with a couple of rooms or even a duplex or fourplex, that would be amazing. You can get an FHA loan, a 3% down loan on a fourplex and go well over a million dollars in, in California to get that with just 3% down. That's like $30,000. It's It really doesn't require a lot of money. Then you get to do something called house hacking, which means you can rent out other rooms or you can put the property on Airbnb or as a short-term rental when you're not using it. You've just got to kind of make some of those sacrifices that makes it work, which is what Rich and I did. Our first property, we well, even when we were renting houses, we would rent out rooms within the house to kind of help with the cash flow. But when we bought our first house, we did the same thing. We kind of turned it into a fourplex, you know, and just made little separate spaces. We didn't really want anyone in our kitchen. So we put little kitchenettes in the rooms and just kind of lock off the doors. So it's like, that's your space. This is ours. But it really, it really helped. So that's called house hacking. That's kind of a term bigger pockets came up with, but it, it makes sense. You're, you're kind of hacking your way to wealth uh, by, by using more leverage, the bank loan as leverage, but then also rental income as leverage. Remember, you don't have to live like this forever, especially if you're in a situation where you can work from home for a period of time, you can literally live anywhere and get that loan. So uh, maybe you live in California, you could go buy something in Cleveland or Alabama uh, or an area where you'd want to hold on to that property. And as I said, live there for a while, there's no kind of set time period. You just would have to have a really good reason why you no longer live there if you leave. No, no big committing bank fraud here. <laughs> Your intention needs to be to live there. All right. If that doesn't work and you find out that you simply don't have enough money to get that 3% down or to qualify for a loan, 
then kind of need to work on those things, work on getting some steady income to your job history, some savings, fixing your credit so that in the future, you can be a good borrower. But in the meantime, you know, you can do lease options. Um, you can find maybe a seller who is in a tough spot. The house has been on the market for a long time. Maybe they would do a lease to own or even a sub to subject to kind of deal where you just take over their mortgage. They maybe don't have a lot of equity. Um, you're able to take it over and you don't even have to use any of your own credit or money to do that. There's a, a whole process for the subject to. I've never done it. I am no pro, but uh, I, there's lots of people out there. Just look it up. There's books on the topic. Um, to find out how to do that. And then if you have time, I would maybe learn how to wholesale. It's another way to get into real estate. And uh, But you're not holding anything. You're just kind of like a middleman, almost like a real estate agent, which again, is another great way to make money. Uh, not not the best time to be a real estate agent. They're getting hit pretty hard these days. Sales, vol sales volume is way down. But if you really just want to be in the real estate business, you know, maybe get into the business, like literally get in the business, earn money. Like I did my, my first job in real estate was as a mortgage broker. So it helped me really understand the business. All right. And, um, and then seller financing. Sometimes you've got people who are older, maybe they inherited a property. They can't sell it for whatever reason. Maybe it's got some issues that needs to be fixed. They might be willing to do seller financing. I actually have a property like that right now that I would seller finance to someone who'd be willing to fix it up. Oh, now that I've said it on the Real Well Show, it's in Malibu. <laughs> if anybody would like to fix up a property, uh, because you know maybe the person who owns the property just doesn't have the time or energy to, to do that. And maybe you have the skills. So looking for a distressed property, that it's a problem for somebody else, but it would be a solution for you and you can provide a solution for them. There's lots of books on this too, seller financing, go look it up. All right, next question. How do I use the equity in my home to purchase a rental property and is this wise? You know, I did do a show recently, a real wealth show on HELOCs. And the thing about getting a HELOC is they're, they're pretty high rate. You know, you're looking at I think ours is nine or 10% might've come down a little bit. So I don't love using that money. That's expensive money, but it is an option. If you're in a really low first loan at two or 3% and you don't want to touch that, but you are willing to get a HELOC that's 10%, maybe when you average it out, it's not that bad, you know, between the two and the 10%. Uh, but getting a HELOC on your primary is uh, I don't think a bad idea if you're able to turn around and invest it into something that's going to give you a bigger return. Now, if you're borrowing the money at 10%, you're going to be needing to get a pretty good return. So it's a little bit more risky. Another way to do it is do a complete refi, where maybe you're, you're refining into a 6% loan. Now you can make that work if you're able to get a lot of equity out, cash out, and go invest, invest that. That's a little bit um, not as challenging as trying to beat a 10% return. Although I got to say, a lot of people don't quite know how to do real estate math. But I just want to point out that if you bought a, a property for, I'm just going to use easy math, $100,000, and you put 20% down, that's $20,000. And let's say the property went up in value uh, by 5%. That's $5,000, right? So you put in $20,000 to buy the property, 20% down on a $100,000 property. And if it just went up in value by 5%, you kind of made about $5,000. Well, that's a 25% return on your money. If you look at, I put in 20,000 and I made 5,000, not a bad return. So a lot of people don't realize how much money they're actually making in, in real estate um, through the, the power of leverage. So if you look at it that way, borrowing at 10% to get a 25% return isn't too shabby. But again, you need to be in an area where it's pretty well expected that you would get that kind of return. All right. Um, so am I against taking money out of your home? Absolutely not. Uh, leverage is the key to building wealth. And when you can get affordable leverage, the most affordable leverage you can get, the cheapest money you can get is money on your, your primary residence because banks are really happy to lend on, on a primary at the lowest rates. So yeah, absolutely. But if you're going to do this and take money out of your home, you better know how to invest. Don't be throwing it at somebody's brand new business that they've never done before or, you know, and 
GameStop or something like that. Okay, no Bitcoin. Um, it needs to really be invested in something that is is uh, is a pretty sure thing. All right. Um, third question: How do I know I've scaled my portfolio enough? When is enough enough? Let me tell you. People constantly are forgetting what enough is enough is. And if you don't know what enough is, then you're never going to know. And you're going to constantly be chasing a dream that you're not even clear about. So the very first step, and we put this in our book, Scaling Smart, the f- first step always is knowing where you're going. <laughs> like what would make you happy? So I usually say, you better know your expenses. Look at your expenses. What does it take you to live a life that you love? Um, you know, what's your overhead? What, what's your vacations cost? What, and I'm not talking about like, like rich world stuff. I'm talking about what would make you happy. Uh, you know, your food and so forth. Look at what your expenses are and then you can determine from there. Okay. I can live pretty comfortably on $10,000 a month. Great. Then, then that's your goal. Once you get to $10,000 a month cash flow, you can reset, you know, and say, maybe, maybe I actually need 20,000 a month to live the dream life, to go travel to Europe instead of camping, you know, in the dirt somewhere. <laughs> so um, so you, you're constantly reevaluating you're there. But the, where people get stuck is forgetting that probably the most important thing we have and the thing that we have the limited, the most limited amount of is time. Time passes so quickly. So it's more important than anything to make sure that you're spending your time the way you want to. And and then you can determine what is that worth to me? Is a vacation to Europe and working longer for that important to me versus I just want to have more free time to be with my kids or do art or go exercise or whatever. So getting super clear on your three-year five-year and 10-year goal is going to help you know where your where is and, you know, and, and what, what your values are, what matters to you. And then you can reevaluate, reevaluate every year. We do every January. That's what Januarys are for. That's what our live event is for. And I hope you'll be able to join us January 18th for our real wealth event where Rich will be taking you through that. He's going to do his focused investor workshop. It is the most popular one. Uh, People come to get that focused. You know, what am I trying to do here? I'm not just trying to buy a bunch of houses. There's a reason. Um, So having that plan, that vision, you'll get that at our live event. And then I'll be giving our 2025 housing forecast that's been ever popular, kind of help navigate where we're all going in uh, in this business. And then we'll have 10 property teams coming out from around the country to tell us what's happening in their markets, how they do their property management, how they find us such great deals at Real Wealth, how they negotiate interest rates down to 3%. It's crazy. Anyway, you can find out about that at realwealthshow.com. Just click on the connect tab and you'll see live events right there. I hope to see you there. Thank you so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.